Welcome back to Dr. Finance. This is a paper by Bertil Olin, who won a Nobel Prize in Economics in 1977. This is a paper he published in Cooperation and Conflict, 1965, titled Some Aspects of the European Economic Integration, A View from the North. So let's go. The European Economic Community is an attempt to Con contribute to the solution of two problems. The first one is the first one is political, and the second one economic. It is of paramount importance that the strength of the democracies in Western Europe is equal to the task which they encounter as a result of the post-war emergence of a strong communi communistic, communistic bloc in Eastern Europe. The EEC stands out as a highly constructive achievement. It has no doubt bridged old enmities and radically improved the relations between the member states. One can only hope that its development will continue and that it will become a center of increased democratic strength and peace in the world. The other object of the EEC, which is of course closely related to the former, has been and is to strengthen the Western European states economically. Above all, it attempts to make a decisive contribution to the solution of the problems of larger markets in industrialized states on the European continent and also to assist in the development of a number of less industrialized countries in Africa. The member states have insisted that there should be the same boundaries between members and non-members in Europe, and in the political union and in the Organization for Economic Cooperation through a new end large market. This idea is indeed characteristics, a characteristic of the EEC. It is not, however, at all self-evident that it should uh, uh, self-evident that it should be so. One may well ask why the members of the EEC could not help to organize a still larger economic market. This attempt was made through the molding plan in the years 1957 to 58. It was turned down chiefly by the French government as not opportune at that time. But it may be justified to come back to the question now. When the member of EEC have come closer together, e.g. through a number of common institutions, the earlier idea in the EEC was that a fairly high protectionistic tariff around the community and the free trade side would help to foster a feeling of common interest. It would lead to an integration of industrial firms and organizations in a way that would give increased stability to the EEC and help to bridge difficulties that might arise on the political level. Now, when the community has built up strength and cohesion, the assistance of exactly this type of economic policy may no longer be needed. Why should it be regarded as self-evident that European economic integration should be subordinated to the political integration and be regarded primarily as a method to promote the latter. In my opinion, there is not sufficient justification for this attitude. I therefore find it difficult to understand that a protectionistic external policy in the EEC, a fairly high tariff and special so-called equalization import taxes, should be a condition of a successful uh, development of this community. We all know very well the outcome of negotiations between Great Britain and the EEC in 1959 
and the failure in 1963 of the second attempt to bring Great Britain in as a member of the organization. Mm. From the point of view of Sweden and Switzerland, it seems two years ago highly doubtful if these countries, with their policy of non-alliance and neutrality, would have any chance of becoming members or associated members of the EEC. There was a risk that Great Britain, Denmark and Norway might enter and that Sweden and Switzerland and Finland might be left outside. A cleavage line would divide the north in two parts, with Sweden and Finland on one side, Denmark and Norway on the other. In many respects, this would have been a tragic development. To a large extent, it would have finished the old and growing cooperation in the north. What happened in 1963 now belongs to history. It is generally agreed that for a con considerable period of time, there is little or no chance that Great Britain and other members of the EFTA will enter the community. If this is taken as a working hypothesis, at least for one not improbable line of development, it has to be admitted that the countries outside the community have their market problem. They also, like the con continental states, need to be partners in large market, in a large market. There is, of course, a chance that the GATT negotiations in Geneva, the so-called Kennedy Round, will lead to an international agreement on a large reduction of tariffs in general, perhaps by something like 50% in the course of five years. If that happens, the need for special regional markets will be less urgent. But the chances of such a tar tariff reduction appear at present, in my opinion, to be rather small. Secondly, there would remain some feeling of insecurity as to the reliability and the durability of a widespread tariff reduction. For this and other reasons, I suppose that everybody has to admit that is that is was quite natural that Western European countries outside the community were eager to create a free trade association of their own. A market for a hundred million people is a good beginning for a future larger organization. In some quarters, there has been a feeling that the EFTA was created to put sticks in the wheels of the community. I do not believe that there is any truth in that interpretation of events. Nevertheless, it is a fact that there remains in some cir circles of the com community in an impression that EFTA simply should not exist. Permit me to use a metaphor and say that some people who are doing a wonderful job in building the community can be compared to people who are building a house. They are a little angry that another group is also building a house, rather than to stand freezing outside in the street, waiting for the first group to find that the time has come to let the outsiders in, on condition that, uh, on condition, of course, that they are well behaved and accept the rules. In my opinion, the time has come to forget mutual irritations and to accept that not only the EEC, but also the EFTA is worthwhile. An idea which dominates the construction of the community is that a large market cannot function well unless economic and social policies are to a large extent harmonized and a number of common institutions are created. I am not talking about the justification of such methods in an attempt to foster political rapprochement. I am looking upon this question from a purely economic point of view. 
The idea of necessary harmonization of social policies in the different member states in order to equalize social insurance payments and other indirect social costs of business corpor corporations does not seem well founded. What matters for the competitive power of industry in one country is the total cost of labor per unit of output, not a part thereof. Obviously, the cash wage cannot be equalized. Why should the other part of labor cost be the same in all the countries considered? Social conditions like the hours of work per week may differ between the countries just as climatic conditions do. We cannot equalize climate, and nobody suggests that trade becomes unnatural or harmful for that reason. Hence, it cannot be said that social conditions must be the same to avoid a harmful development. It is quite another question that good government and the economic policy that leads to other favorable conditions for business, including above all reasonable taxes, will help to bring about a rapid development. Hence, there may be a rise a certain there may arise a certain competition between government in member states with regard to such policies. It is not self-evident that this should be reg regretted. My reasoning so far has led me to emphasize two facts. The economic problem of a large market is a different one from the political problem in Western Europe. The former may be regarded as subordinate to the second one, but this is not a, at all necessary. The second conclusion is that a good function of a large market, like a free trade area, does not presuppose the complete harmonization of economic and social policies. For the possible future coordination of the two large markets in Europe, is it, it is, I think essentially, I think essential uh, for the possible future con coordination of the two large markets in Europe. It is, I think, essential that this latter fact is kept in mind. If the government governments that are members of the community continue to insist that they cannot take part in any large market unless the attitude to harmonization and common institutions adopted in the Rome Treaty and followed up later by the community is accepted for the larger markets also, then I expect that formidable and not in itself natural, uh, natural difficulties for a constructive solution of the market problem might arise. If the community maintains its present attitude in these two respects, it is quite possible that new ways of viewing the problem of large European markets will appear. The EFTA is too small and its members are aware of it. <clears throat> what will happen if the Kennedy Round should not succeed in bringing about any considerable reduction of tariffs and no promise that a further reduction will come in the following years? It is, not, uh, it is to be expected that the various countries will put the blame on each other for such a failure e.g. for the inst insistence of uh, for the insistence on a unreasonable long list of products for which tariffs will not be reduced probably the spokesman for the community will maintain that the united states is the chief responsible chiefly responsible party whereas the americans will respond that the unwillingness of the EEC to compromise has been the main obstacle. <clears throat> In such a situation, both the United States and Canada and the EFTA will be anxious to expand the market for manufactured goods in particular. One idea is that North America and EFTA might together form a free trade area. Initially and for a long time, it would of course not be a really, really tariff area, a really 
free trade area, but rather a preferential tariff area. To, satisfactory, uh, to satisfy the GATT rules, it would be necessary to talk about completely free trade inside the territory sometime in the distant future. But this talk may be rather loose. For practical purposes, therefore, it may be a kind of preferential tariff area for North America and DEFTA. One may hold, for instance, that long before radical steps of internal tariff reductions become practical policies, a new situation will be created. The relations to the European economic community may be changed and some coordination brought out. Ideas of this kind are only beginning to appear. Personally, I do not believe that much more than cooperation in trade policy comparable with the most favored nation principle would become practical politics in the first few years. Not much has been said publicly about the, these problems, but I know that both the United States and Canada and it, in some after quarters, such ideas are discussed in private, chiefly in connection with the problem. What should we do if the Kennedy round fails to bring about substantial results? In my opinion, it cannot be denied that the logic of things may lead events in this direction. If both EFTA and North America want freer policies, they might find it natural to get together in trade policy. They might also invite other countries to join, e.g. Australia. One cannot say where such a development would end. For the community and particularly for some member countries like Germany and Benelux, a development of this kind would seem to be a serious and not altogether satisfactory prospect. Most Europeans would, I suppose, agree that a more natural development would be the following. The Kennedy round leads to substantial tariff reductions in all round. This would coincide with the interest of non-European countries also. Secondly, the large common market is created which will embrace the whole of Western Europe, i.e., all the states that are now members of the EEC or of the EFTA. It is conceivable that both the present groups of European countries may enter a large Western European free trade area, which would initially be a preferential tariff area. Two years from now, there will be no duties on manufactured goods worth mentioning inside which of the each of the two European markets. Why not bring them together in a preferential tariff area which accepts as a goal to be a free trade area? Could not the political problems in Western Europe be solved just as easily if the economic market problem were treated in this way as if they were handled according to the a somewhat stale pattern of the Roman treaty. Apart from the North Atlantic Treaty of Defense, there would be room for a European political agreement, which most of the Western European states, but not all of them, would accept. The third pillar would be the economic organization, which would include e.g. Sweden, Switzerland, and for pr practical purposes, Finland. As I have already indicated, it is undesirable that the members of the community wanted a considerable tariff wall during the first years of the existence of the organization to make it easier to create common institutions and to increase the economies so as to bring about a community of interest and the feeling of unity, which may be of great importance for the political development of the community. But towards the end, towards the end of the 1960s, the situation in this respect may well be different. 
one can hardly maintain that the EEC would be exposed to grave danger if it enters as a unit into a preferential tariff area with the EFTA countries. Such an agreement would later lead to the establishment of a free trade area and would certainly help to strengthen the European economy and thereby have a favorable indirect political effect. A Western Europe in two blocks, which might breed irritation and misunderstanding, would be avoided. One of the advantages of such an organization is that it would enable countries with different attitudes to defense and foreign policy to play their role as partners in, the, in a constructive economic work. Sweden and Switzerland would certainly be active members and not left outside in the desert. I understand, of course, that some people in the community who have thought that sooner or later Great Britain and some other EFTA members would come with their hats in hands and ask for permission to enter the community may find it difficult to accept at once a solution based on the equality between the EEC and EFTA members in the building of the large, uh, one, one large European market. But is it not often the best policy to understand when conditions have changed and to modify attitudes accordingly? I have been asked if the Benelux Union and the Nordic countries, which are united in the Nordic Council, cannot do anything to bring the community and the EFTA together. What I have said so far, what I have said so far, is partly an answer. It indicates one way: the Benelux Union and the Nordic countries might render a real service by promoting a better understanding inside the European groups about the conditions under which coordination and later a merger of the two European markets might be possible in the relatively near future. It is certainly of, uh, of common interest to the Benelux and the Nordic countries that economic conflicts between the EEC and the EFTA can be avoided. There is nothing to be gained through a development where Holland obtains a preferential treatment in Germany for its agricultural exports, whereas Denmark more or less excluded from the market of the community, as a consequence, receives similar preferential treatment on the British market. But it would certainly be an illusion to think that the agricult uh, agricultural policy accepted inside the EEC at present will have no consequence on the agricultural policy in EFTA in the long run. In political circles in Scandinavia, where uh, there is a great deal of admiration for the people who built up the Benelux Union, they demonstrated unusual resourcefulness and skill. I once asked the Bel uh, Belgian foreign minister, Mr. Spark, how they could bring about the Benelux Union so quickly. We had been working in Scandinavia for about 10 years with investigation about a Nordic tariff union and had not at that time yet reached the stage for decision. Mr. Spock answered that if you ask the experts to analyze a large problem, they always found so many difficulties in the way of action that nothing happened. The best way to decide the main thing one wants to happen and then to ask the experts to investigate about the best method to reach that goal, that I believe is the way the Benelux countries acted. If we in the north are now getting a Nordic free trade area, 
it is not due to decisions based on 10 years of analysis, but to international economical development, which brought about the European Free Trade Association. I have always felt that there is a great deal of affinity between the attitude in the Benelux countries towards international economic problems and the attitude in the North. In the years before the war, or before the war, the nations which now belong to these two groups included the Oslo Agreement, which was on one of the first steps in Europe towards regional cooperation in trade policy. A very modest one, it is true, but still a step to counteract protectionist tendencies. I am sure that it would cause a great deal of satisfaction among the citizens of the North if the Benelux and the Nordic countries could get together and find ways and means to assist in a development of a large European economic market organized without necessarily political com uh, complications. Difficulties are great enough anyway. The most important member of such a market would be the economic community. Of course, the interests of the less developed countries uh, in Africa could be safeguarded and the tariff policy pursued that would be con uh, acceptable to the United States and to those countries in other parts of the world that want closer economic con contact contacts and freer trade. Thanks for listening.